Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we're continuing our discussion of endocrine drugs, and this is recording part two. Now we're going to talk about NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are drugs that inhibit the COX family of enzymes. COX is for cyclooxygenase. The COX enzymes are involved in a complex biochemical pathway that converts arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. There are two main subtypes of the COX enzymes. COX-1 is constitutive, which means it has a constant level of activity. COX-1 is involved in maintenance and involved in three things that you need to remember. The first is maintenance and protection of gastric mucosa in order to protect it from ulceration from the gastric acid. Second, platelet aggregation and normal platelet function. Third, maintenance of renal blood flow. The COX-2 enzyme is the one that we're interested in here. It is inducible, which means it changes its activity when there is injury at a specific site. The COX-2 enzyme is responsible for pain and inflammation. It regulates the sensitivity of your peripheral nociceptors, and it also can cross the blood-brain barrier to facilitate spinal nociception. The COX-2 enzyme is also involved in fever. So when we are treating patients, we are usually interested in the effects of the COX-2 enzyme. Here's a diagram that shows arachidonic acid being converted into prostaglandins, some of which are involved in gastric protection, hemostasis, through platelets and renal function, others that cause pain, fever, and inflammation. NSAIDs block both of these, but we will see that there are some COX-2-specific enzymes that uh, uh, NSAIDs that only block the COX-2 enzyme, and we may find that to be preferable. Different substances have a different degree of inhibition of COX-1 relative to COX-2. So we can see ketorolac, which is very, very uh, COX-1 selective and has very little COX-2 selectivity, all the way up through to drugs that aren't on the market anymore, like rofecoxib, which has very high COX-2 selectivity. And here we see, again, COX-1 sparing actions of COX-2 selective drugs, going from ketorolac all the way down to rofecoxib and others. Why do we like NSAIDs so much? Well, they're very effective in treating pain with few side effects. They deactivate and desensitize the nociceptors. They decrease inflammation. People don't get addicted or dependent to them. They actually work synergistically with opioids, may even provide some preemptive analgesia. There's no nausea and, and there's no respiratory depression. Nausea and vomiting are minimal. They have a nice long duration of action, and they don't make people sleepy or confused or give other cognitive side effects. We've already talked about aspirin, which is often abbreviated ASA for acetyl salicylic acid. Aspirin is a nonspecific COX inhibitor. It's good for analgesia. It's antipyretic, which means it blocks fever and it has antiplatelet function, as we know. And that's due to its irreversible acetylation of the platelet's COX-1 enzymes. That's why people use it to prevent and treat strokes and seizure, strokes and, um, and MI, and also to prevent thrombosis inside of a coronary stent. Usually, if you're concerned about bleeding, you hold aspirin for seven to 10 days prior to the surgery, that is the life of a platelet, and that gives you time to generate new platelets that have not been irreversibly bound. Patients with uremia can be very sensitive to aspirin because they already have some platelet dysfunction. Aspirin does not have very much renal effect, but we're mostly concerned about the bleeding. It has a lot of effect on platelets. It can also have GI irritation because of that mucosal protection that's being blocked through the COX-1 enzyme. Patients who are taking aspirin, generally speaking, may have neuraxial blocks like spinals or epidurals, even while they're still taking aspirin or other NSAIDs. A significant portion of asthmatic adults, somewhere between 8 and 20 percent, are at risk for bronchoconstriction when they receive aspirin. And this is actually true for all other nonspecific NSAIDs as well. Aspirin is not used in children anymore, especially if they have any sort of viral syndrome. And that's because of something called Rye syndrome, which is a syndrome that involves acute encephalopathy and hepatic failure. 
And even though there's something out there called baby aspirin, they haven't given it to babies or children for a long time because of Rye syndrome. Aspirin is hydrolyzed in the liver into salicylic acid and then metabolized and excreted in the kidneys. Patients who overdose on aspirin have an unusual CNS stimulation that leads them to have hyperventilation. And so as a result, they have an unusual combination of respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis. Moving on to other NSAIDs. Ibuprofen, also called Motrin or Advil, is analgesic, antipyretic, and anti-inflammatory. It's metabolized in the liver with a first pass effect when given orally. It's also available IV. It doesn't accumulate over time and can be given every six hours. Side effects of ibuprofen include GI irritation and ulceration and some platelet dysfunction. It can also exacerbate pre-existing renal dysfunction due to the decreased renal blood flow. Napr naproxen, or naproxen, also called Aleve, is similar to ibuprofen, but with twice daily dosing instead of every six to eight hours. Ketorolac, or Toradol, is commonly used for post-operative analgesia. It can be given IV or IM. It can be used alone or together with opioids. 30 milligrams of IM Toradol is equivalent to 10 milligrams of morphine. It does have inhibition of platelet aggregation and decreased renal blood flow, especially in patients with CHF or hypovolemia. Its peak effect occurs in 45 to 60 minutes and has an elimination halftime of about five hours. It can be ordered as a scheduled Q6 hour dosing for four to six doses in order to have adequate pain control. Ketorolac is 99% protein bound. Can NSAIDs be used in pregnancy and in children? In general, we don't recommend NSAIDs during pregnancy, especially during the third trimester. NSAIDs can cause premature closure of the fetal ductus arteriosus and also limit renal blood flow. There are some links between premature birth and miscarriage and use of NSAIDs during pregnancy. In children, NSAIDs are considered to be safe to use after about six months of age. So we've talked about the COX non-specific NSAIDs. Now we're going to talk about COX-2 specific inhibitors. Celebrex or celecoxib is effective in treating pain or inflammation of arthritis and surgery. It's well absorbed from the GI tract with not very much first pass metabolism. It's safer for patients who have gastritis or gastric ulcers, has no platelet effects, is well tolerated by patients who have asthma, metabolized in the liver and excreted in the kidneys. Similar drugs like Vioxx and Bextra were actually withdrawn from the market due to risk of MI and stroke. It seems that too much COX-2 specific inhibition causes not anti-thrombotic events, but pro-thrombotic events. And so it seems there needs to be a good balance between COX-1 and COX-2 inhibition in order to avoid pro-thrombotic events. The next medication is uh, closely related to the NSAIDs, and it is acetaminophen or Tylenol. This drug is a little bit more complicated, and its mechanism of action is still not fully understood. It does have a slight anti-inflammatory effect, which is probably mediated through COX-1 and COX-2 inhibition, although this is primarily in the central nervous system, and it therefore causes analgesia, as well as the antipyretic, the anti-fever effect. There doesn't seem to be any anti-inflammatory effect in peripheral tissues, which is why I say it's not really like the other NSAIDs. Um, and there's also a direct antipyretic effect in the hypothalamus. In addition, there is a metabolite called AM404, um, and that substance seems to activate cannabinoid receptors and TRPV1 receptors, um, as well as some COX-1 and COX-2 inhibition, also leading to analgesia. There may also be an effect on the serotonergic inhibitory pathways in the CNS. <clears throat> and altogether, 
we see that acetaminophen is an effective analgesic drug and has wonderful synergy with opioids, which is why we see a lot of drugs in combination, like Percocet is oxycodone plus acetaminophen. The set, C-E-T, stands for acetaminophen. Most notably is that acetaminophen really has no effect on gastric irritation or platelets, uh, which is something we associate with all of the other NSAIDs. Acetaminophen is metabolized in the liver into inactive metabolites. Toxins are scavenged by glutathione. It has a significant first-pass effect with oral dosing. High doses of acetaminophen lead to formation of two toxins, paraaminophenol, which is nephrotoxic, and N-acetyl parabenzoquinone, which is hepatotoxic. At doses greater than 4 grams per day, patients are at risk for hepatic necrosis. This is higher risk in chronic alcohol users because of their increased P450 activity and also their decreased glutathione stores. Patients who consume a single large dose of alcohol and then take acetaminophen the next day are probably not at high risk. Even heavy chronic alcohol users who take a single dose of acetaminophen are probably not at very high risk. But heavy chronic alcohol users who take multiple doses of acetaminophen are at increased risk for hepatic necrosis, and if they must use acetaminophen, should probably consider a lower daily maximum dose, say maybe 2 grams per day. The treatment for acetaminophen overdose is acetylcysteine, which is an antioxidant used to prevent hepatic damage if you can be given within 8 hours of the overdose. Acetaminophen is available orally as regular and extra strength, 325 milligrams and 500 milligrams. Recommended dose is 650 to 1,000 milligrams every six hours. Again, not to exceed four grams in 24 hours. And now they're recommending three grams in 24 hours to further avoid risk of hepatic injury. We also have IV acetaminophen called Ofermev. Its advantage is that it rapidly increases plasma concentrations and CNS concentrations without any first pass effect. It can be dosed every six hours, and it's dosed the same dosing, 650 to 1,000 milligrams every six hours. But since there's no first pass effect, CNS levels will be much higher than they would be with oral administration. That's it for this section. Please let me know if you have any questions.